Hello students, welcome back to lecture 28 of this course. In the last lecture, I started discussing about microscopy. We discussed about four very important concepts in microscopy. One is your magnification, the second is resolution and the third is your uh, illumination and then we started discussing about the fourth which is contrast. There are other methods, I started with uh, phase contrast, there are other methods uh, to increase the contrast in microscopy and I am going to discuss one of such method and that is polarization. So, contrast can be uh, achieved with the polarization. So, first thing which we need to know is what is polarization. This is orientation of electric field. Most light sources produce unpolarized light and what does that mean is that it does not have preferred polarization angle. So, here is your electromagnetic wave and as we discussed during our initial lectures that there are two fields magnetic and electric field which are orthogonal to each other and here what we are concerned about is orientation of electric field. So, what polarizers does? They specifically transmit one polarization angle of light. So, if you take normal light, what happens is there is no preferred angle of that is what we talked about here no preferred angle, no preferred polarization angle. So, ordinary light is a mixture of polarized light with at different angles, polarized light at different angles. When you pass this through a polarizer, what it will do is, it will transmit only one polarization angle of light. So, here you see if I take a you know polarizer which axis is like this vertical, then it will only allow this vertical light to pass through, to pass through. Other lights are blocked, other lights are blocked. And now, suppose I take another polarizer the axis is horizontal, axis is horizontal, then what it will do is, it will not allow this light to pass through, to pass through. So, if we have a combination of these two polarizers, one is vertical polarizer followed by a horizontal polarizer, then there will be no light which will transmit and this kind of polarizers are called crossed polarizer. So, electromagnetic radiation including visible light vibrates in all direction perpendicular to the direction of travel when emanating from a source. That is what I discussed that before passing the polarizer, your electromagnetic radiation vibrates in all directions perpendicular to direction of travel. What polarizer filter does? It transmit a single plane of light, single plane of light absorbing the remainder and if you use vertical polarizers, polarizer, it will transmit a vertical plane of light. Where two polarizer are arranged with their permitted vibration direction at 90 degree to one another, they are referred as cross polarizer. 
and no light will be transmitted until an anisotropic specimen is placed between them. If there is no anisotropic specimen, then no light will trans transmit. So, in polarized light microscopy, what we do is that we use two polarizer arranged at 90 degree angle to block all light. So, that is what you can see that this is your incident beam which is unpolarized. When it pass through a polarizer 1, then you have vertically polarized light wave and when it pass through the polar, uh, polarizer 2 which is horizontal, then after that there will be no light getting transmitted. Microscope needs two polarizer, one is called polarizer and another is called your analyzer. Cross polarizer I already discussed that cross polarizer is two polarizer arranged at 90 degree, but microscopy needs two polarizer one called polarizer and second called analyzer. Here we use bi refrigerants, bi refrigerant materials are quite unique. They have different indices of refraction for light polarized parallel or perpendicular to the optical axis. So, when we pass white light through a polarizer, it gives you single plane of light, it gives you single plane of light. Now, if we put analyzer and what we expect that there will be no light we should go across this analyzer, but what we did is we put a bi refrigerant material which is basically an isotropic crystal. It has property that it has different indices of refraction for light polarized parallel or perpendicular to the optical axis. And so, what you will get is two beams with orthogonal polarization. If we put illumination at an angle of the optical axis, if it is along polarizer axis, then this will not be seen. Only when you put it at an angle to the optical axis, then two beams with orthogonal polarization will be produced. Two beams with orthogonal polarization will be produced and when it pass through the analyzer, there will be a path difference between the two rays, one is known as ordinary ray and another is known as extraordinary ray and the retardation is given by this formula delta n into t. So, when ordinary and extraordinary rays emerge from the bi refrigerant crystal, they are still vibrating at right angles with respect to one another. So, after passing through this, there will be two orthogonal rays, one is called ordinary ray, another is called extraordinary ray and they are at 90 degree to each other. However, the components of this wave that pass through the analyzer are vibrating in the same flame. So, these are the, these are the waves, uh, these are the component of ordinary and extraordinary waves they are vibrating in the same plane, but with a path difference and that path difference leads to retardation, that path difference leads to retardation. Now, let us understand it much more clearly. This is your x y diagram on y axis, this is 
y axis there is A which denotes analyzer axis and here is T which denotes polarizer axis. Polarizer axis when you have the bi refrigerant crystal not making any angle with the axis then what will happen that all light will go through polarizer and we can not see anything on the analyzer nothing will pass through analyzer but if suppose we put at angle alpha if we put this crystal at angle alpha then what will happen that a ray will be the analyzer will pass a ray along this axis and that is known as ordinary ray and there will be another ray which will be coming out which is perpendicular to this ray and that is known as extraordinary ray. They are orthogonal to each other, they are orthogonal to each other and resultant of these waves is shown here, resultant of this wave is shown here and the component of this resultant on analyzer is given by R analyzer is given by R and the value of R on the analyzer axis is proportional to the amount of light passing through the analyzer. So, value of R on the analyzer axis is proportional to amount of light passing through the analyzer. This indicates that some light from the polarizer passes through the analyzer and the bi refrigerant crystal displays some order the brightness. If this crystal bi refrigerant crystal makes an angle 45 degree then your ordinary ray will make 45 degree with this axis positive p axis where extra ordinary ray will make 45 degree angle with negative p axis and the resultant will be maximum, the resultant will be maximum. So, if you look at this what we told that there will be a path difference if this light passes through analyzer A, these two extra ordinary ray and ordinary ray passes through the analyzer A. They are going to be in same plane, but with a part difference and the part difference or retardation is given by delta n into t and that is what is written here. Retardation is thickness into bi refrigerance which is basically the refractive index difference between high and low and t denotes thickness. So, because one may be retarded with respect to other interference either constructive or destructive occurs between wave as they pass through the analyzer and the net result is that some refrigerant samples acquire a spectrum of color when observed in white light through crossed polarizers and this is how contrast is generated in polarization microscopy and now you can see that you take a pencil and put a bi calcite crystal on it you will see the two figures. In summary the n isotropic substance will split the plain polarized light into two different yet still coherent rays each with a unique velocity determined by refractive indices of the specimen. These two coherent rays arising from a common source will recombine and interfere when they leave the specimen. The optical part difference between two rays depend on product of birefringence and thickness of the specimen and the highly saturated polarization color seen as a result of interference of these two rays once they are recombined. 
A compensator such as first order red plate intensify this polarization colors and that is how contrast is generated in polarization microscopy. Till now we have seen the illumination in microscopy being done with the visible light, but illumination can be done using lights other than visible light. We can basically employ the whole of electromagnetic spectrum. When in the rim of visible light, blue and ultraviolet light have wavelength half that of red light. So, an improvement of twice the resolution is available. D is proportional to lambda and if D is low, then resolution is high. So, if I uh, half the wavelength, if I half the wavelength, D will be half and thus resolution will be higher. If you go to even a smaller lambda, for example, if you go to X-rays, they can improve the resolution. And so, X-ray microscope can produce resolution of 10 nanometer and there is another advantage that X-ray uh, can penetrate most material. So, keeping this in mind, Kohler also thought about developing a microscope which is based on UV light. Since UV light has a smaller lambda than visible light. So, first fluorescence microscope was built by Kohler at the Jays factory as an attempt to improve the resolution for light microscopy by the use of UV light. In that what he did is the specimen is illuminated with light of a specific wavelength which is absorbed by the fluorophore causing them to emit light of longer wavelength. The illuminated light is separated from the much weaker emitted fluorescence through the use of spectral emission filter. And this is your uh, schematic of a fluorescence microscope. So, what it has been done is light comes from this source, it is reflected by dichroic mirror, it is reflected by dichroic mirror, it comes passes through objective and then it is absorbed by a specimen. A specimen emits the light and it passes through objective then it can pass through dichroic mirror. The reflected light will not pass through it and so there is importance of this dichroic mirror. This dichroic filter which is a thin film filter is a very accurate color filter used to selectively pass light of a small range of colors while reflecting other colors. So, other colors will be reflected and only the emitted light will pass through this dichroic mirror to detector, to detector and that is the principle of fluorescence microscope. There was one problem with this wide film fluorescence microscopy. So, wide film means if I am trying to take the image of every part of the specimen at a same time or we are trying to take the picture of a specimen, picture of a specimen as a whole. Then what you will get is you know blurred picture, blurred picture. And so, if you want to take picture of a specimen at one time, then there is a, uh, there will be a problem of your uh, higher resolution and that is one of the main disadvantage of wide field fluorescence microscopy. So, white fill illumination is just like this and that leads to blurness in the images. 
So, what people come across is what is known as point illumination. So, in point illumination you can remove a blurness. So, let us uh, discuss this. So, what happens that <coughs> in the point illumination what you do is you take a excitation light and you try to focus to a diffraction limited spot. So, one spot you try to focus it to a diffraction limited spot and if you want to do with uh, arc lamp and pinhole you will be able to do that, but it will be very inefficient and so you can use perfectly collimated and high power. If you do that you will get your point illumination. So, that is what we is done fluorescence illumination of a single point what you do you put excited light and if it does you put an objective lens and since it is coming parallel and it will your focus the light on a single point it will focus the light on the single point and that is how you get a point illumination. So, if you remember here that uh, what we told that we need to get at one single point. So, this is your point illumination and once this sample or specimen absorbs the light it will if it has the right fluorescence property it will give you this emission light emission light and if emission light goes like this here there is a tube lens it will again focus to a camera and then one point picture one point picture on a spot on a specimen will come as image at one point, but there can be a problem what can be the problem that if suppose light starts from here then you can get image at this point. So, there will be a blurness there will be a blurness. So, fluorescence is emitted along entire illuminated cone not just at the focus just at the focus. Now, comes the confocal microscope. So, to avoid this blurness what has been used is a pinhole, a pinhole is used. Now, what will happen if you place a pinhole between tube lens and detector what will happen that emitted light from this point will pass through this pinhole, but if it comes from some other places then you see this is stopped emitted from the light emitted from this point is stopped here, stopped here and that is how you can avoid the blurness in the image. So, one focal microscope is a method to get rid of out of focus light and so less blur whole sample is illuminated by scanning single wavelength laser only light from the focal plane is passing through the pinhole to the detector. So, you can see this is a much uh, better picture. So, here this is the laser excitation source then you put a pinhole aperture here also and that allows you to pass the uh, light of single wavelength and it goes it passes when it strikes at different focal plane then it will emit light and that can pass through your pinhole out of focus light from other places will be stopped at this pinhole and that is how you get a much enhanced resolution of the picture. Now, what you do is you can change entrance angle of illumination which will move the illumination spot on the sample. So, till now we have got only one point picture of only one point, but if you want to 
get the picture of whole specimen and what you do is you change entrance angle of illumination and that will move illumination spot on the sample and that is done by taking you know. So, what you do is entrance of entrance angle of illumination is changed and now this point from this point to shifted to this point. Okay. So, the point of focus will change, point of focus will change. So, now you are getting the image of the second point on the sample or a specimen. Now, if you take this kind of ray, then you will get the image of this point, image of this point. And so, emission spot moves. So, we have to make sure pin hole is coincident with it. So, we have to make sure the pin hole is coincident with it. So, you are moving this entrance angle of illumination and then you are shifting your pin hole to get a much better picture of each point of each point. And that you do in raster fashion. So, you take picture of 1 point, 2 point, 3 point, 4 point, 5 point, 6 point and then you go in different planes and you take picture. So, in confocal microscopy, it is a basically an optical imaging technique for increasing optical resolution and contrast of a micrograph. Radiation emitted from blazer cause sample to fluoresce. Now, you are using pinhole screen to produce high resolution images. It eliminates out of focus rays. Image has better contrast and they are less hazy. A series of thin slice of the specimen are assembled to generate a three dimensional image and basically it is a, an updated version of fluorescence microscopy. Now, you can see this is wide field microscopy versus your confocal microscope. Picture are more clear, less hazy. These picture are more hazy, these picture are less hazy and a better contrast, a contrast has been achieved. Similarly, you can look at this picture. This is taken using wide field microscopy and this is taken using confocal microscopy. And this is picture of kidney cells and you can see what is the advantage of using confocal microscopy. So, in confocal microscopy, you are generating high resolution images and 3D reconstruction of a specimen. Again, what you do is a laser light is focused onto a fluorescent specimen through the objective lens. The mixture of reflected and emitted light is captured by the same objective and is sent to dichroic mirror. The reflected light is deviated by the mirror while the emitted fluorescent light passes through confocal aperture to reduce the out of focus light and the focus light then passes through emission filter and proceeds to the photomultiplier tube. And in order to generate an entire image, the single point is scanned in an x y manner as the laser focus is moved over the specimen. This is again few picture where comparison has been made between confocal and wide field microscopy. These are the picture obtained using wide field microscopy and these are the picture obtained using confocal microscopy. You can see that there is a quite better resolution in case of images obtained from confocal microscopy. There are a lot of application of confocal microscopy. In fact, all of the fluorescence microscopy, uh, it has been utilized in stem cell research. It is uh, used to look at the interaction, applying the concept of FRET. Also, people look at fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching and that I will discuss in the next lecture. Then, in situ hybridization can be done, lifetime imaging can be done, multi photon aspect microscopy, uh, total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy, 
DNA hybridization, membrane ion probe and bioluminescent protein and epitope tagging. There are several different kind of ap application is possible with confocal microscopy. I will discuss few of them today and then we will discuss it in next class. So, in fluorescence microscopy first thing is you do is uh, if suppose you want to look at the cell structure first thing you do is you directly stain the cell cells, cells structures. For example, mitochondria you use mito tracker for lysosomes you have a lyso tracker and ER and Golgi you can use lactin conjugates. For other probes for like stage fiber phalloidine conjugates are used whereas to look at nuclei DAP is used. So, different part of the cells has different uh, dyes uh, which can be probed by different dyes. Now, let us look at uh, this is the taken from a paper by Fels et al. JBC 2000 where they looked at lo uh, localization of trap 1 to mitochondria in PC 3 M cells. And you can track mitochondria using cyto tracker and from using DAPI you are looking at the nucleus. So, this is your uh, uh, mitochondria and this, uh, this is your nucleus. And if you look at trap 1 mass mon monoclonal plus if you use antibodies corresponding to that uh, using FITC dye, what you will get is this picture. And then if you combine this, you will get this picture. And using this, they were able to prove the localization of trap 1 to mitochondria in PC 3 M cell. The confocal microscopy or fluorescence microscopy can be used for optical sectioning of objects without physical contact. What you need to do is you just need to use the different dyes. For example, here has been shown the zebra face embryo whole mount and neurons are shown in green, neurons are shown in green and cell adhesion molecule is shown in red. So, since the different part of the your specimen can interact with different dye and so they can be used to look at the optical sectioning of objects we do not need to go and look at the physical contact. You can do three dimensional reconstruction of a specimen. For example, this picture is shown uh, where you can see tight junction in the red. So, these are the tight junction which can be seen in the red and the cytoskeletal structure is seen in green seen in green. So, you can get a very beautiful three dimensional reconstruction of a specimen using fluorescence spectroscopy. Now, you can see that what a good resolution you can obtain from a confocal microscopy. So, this is your picture of rat cerebellum and here astrocytes are given in green and M and dismutase is shown as a red color. What is the distribution of astrocytes and M and dismutase in the rat cerebellum has been shown here. Even you can look at the culture cell and this is the cell growth with the time, the cell growth with the time. So, you can get a very nice picture of the cell morphology during a cell culture. Now, we can also look at co-localization of different proteins. So, this is for vecular H plus ATPase, these are the two domain VHAA if you see here, this is plant V ATPase 
this is uh, plant V atypase and there are you can see there is A domain, there is C domain, there is D domain, there is E domain. So, these are the different domains and uh, if I want to know whether there is a co-localization of these two domain or not A and C, uh, what can be done is uh, you see here what has been done VHAC has been tagged with CFP dye, cyan fluorescence protein and VHA is your tagged with YFP dye. Now, when you excite this at 458 nanometer and take an a scan from 470 to 520 nanometer, you will get this spectrum, this kind of image. If you take this one and excite this to at uh, 5, this at 514 nanometer and take a spectrum between 520 to 570, you will get this figure. And if suppose I excite this one at 458 nanometer or here at 458 nanometer and look a spectrum between 520 to 570 nanometer. So, what I am doing is I am exciting at this 458 nanometer and I am looking a spectra as 520 to 570 nanometer. You can see that still I am able to see this beautiful image, this beautiful image. When that can be possible? If two these domains are close enough, so that freight can take place, freight can take place and that is what is happening here and what it does tells you that VHAC and VHAA are co-localized. Now, let us take the two different domain here VHAE and VHAC. So, now what we are looking at co-localization of E with C. Again it has been tagged with CFP and this is tagged with YFP and you excite at 458 and look between 470 to 520 you see a beautiful picture, you excite at 514 nanometer this one and look at the spectra between 520 to 570 there is a beautiful picture. But now if I try to do this from excite at 458 nanometer and look the spectra at 520 to 570 you see we do not see a uh, good or illuminated picture, what does that mean is, what does this mean is that VHA this E capital E and VHA C domain are not co-localized, they are not co-localized. Then uh, it can be confocal microscopy can uncover toxic nanomaterials and here it has been shown microscopy of a cell with silver nanoparticle, cell nuclei are stained in red while green dots represents a labeled nanoparticle. So, you can look at, so here you see glucose with the HEP G2 cells, galactose HEP G2 cells, mannose HEP G2 cells and glucose neuro 2 A cells, this is with the neuro 2 A cells and now you can see that it is of glucose nano uh, so glucose so what you can see is uh, different distributions of this nanoparticles different distribution of this nanoparticles and uh, you can tell that these nanoparticles are distributed differently in these cells you can also do morphological characterization of a cell Morphological characterization of embryonic stem cell is important in many ways. So, in culture morphology indicates the status of the cell 
example undifferentiated or differentiated and also provide clues about the general health and condition of the cell. For example, whether the cells are apoptotic, necrotic or mycoplasma contaminated and the morphology of the cells can be seen, morphology of the cells can be seen through confocal microscopy. So, this is human embryonic stem cells derived neurons, uh, beta 3 tubulin which is the red positive cells exhibiting elaborate neural network at the end of the differentiation. So, if you are at the end of differentiation, then you will see uh, elaborate neural network otherwise you will not see and thus we can tell you about whether cells are undifferentiated or differentiated, whether cells are in apoptotic condition or necrotic condition or mycoplasma contaminated. The next technique is fluorescence lifetime imaging flame and as the name suggests this is based on a lifetime measurement, based on lifetime measurement which we have already discussed. Now, this that lifetime fluorescence is now being seen through your microscopy. So, film is a fluorescence imaging technique where the contrast is based on the lifetime of individual fluorophores rather than their emission spectra. It produces an image based on the differences in excited state decay rate from decay rate from a fluorescence sample and fluorescence lifetime is the average time that a molecule expands in excited state before coming to ground state through the emission of photon that we have already discussed several times. So, now you can see this is your image and you see red has higher lifetime, blue has lowest lifetime. So, basically you can see the picture of a specimen quite clearly based on the lifetime. One of the very important feature of fluorescence lifetime is that it is independent of concentration, absorption by the sample, sample thickness, photo bleaching and excitation intensity and thus it serves better than intensity based method. But lifetime is affected by environmental factors for example, pH ion oxygen concentration or molecular binding or proximity of energy acceptors and thus if we want to look at the functional imaging, it is a much better choice. For example, let us look at the local environment sensing. I already told you that fluorescence lifetime gets affected by environmental factors and so it can be used as a parameter for biological sensors. Uh, quenching of excited state due to various external factors decreases the lifetime and this decreased fluorescence lifetime provide information about the molecular environment of the floor and thus also allows quantitative distinction between subpopulation of quenched or unquenched fluorophore. So, this flim can also be can be utilized as flame can be utilized as pH indicator. Many fluorescent molecules have protonated and deprotonated forms. So, there is equilibrium exist between two forms depending on pH and if protonated and deprotonated form at different lifetime, the apparent lifetime is an indicator of pH. Apparent lifetime can be used as an indicator of the pH and here it has been shown different adherent cell line display different level of cytosolic pH. The average cytosolic pH values are 7.40 for 3T3 cells, 7.2 for Chinese homester avery cells and 7.15 for MCF7 cells, MCF7 cells. So, you can use an indicator a dye which exists in both protonated and deprotonated form and their equilibria changes with the pH and that is the way you can differentiate or you can 
use them that way you can use them to differentiate the pH of a particular uh, place in our body. Uh, so, pH of different cell has been examined using these dyes and some of the examples I have given here. The first one is for this one A is for 3 T 3 cell, the second one for Chinese hamster ovary cells and the third one is for MCF 7 cells and the different pH value which is the pH value obtained for the cells are different. We can also map the temperature inside a cell. For that we use the fluorophores which are sensitive to temperature. So, some of the fluorophores are weakly fluorescent when it is at lower temperature whereas, they are strongly fluorescent when they are at higher temperature and so they can be used to look at the temperature. Now, you see here this is the same cells and uh, this is uh, 4.6 28 degree Celsius, 7.6 for 40 degree Celsius, this is the different color. So, in a cell you can see that there are different color inside the cell and that is because of different temperature at the different point. So, fluorescence intensity of fluorophore is higher in the nucleus and that is why you see this kind of color. Then in surrounding cytoplasm, what does that mean is nucleus is hot. So, temperature mapping inside the cell can be done using the flame. We can also measure the calcium 2 plus concentration. Calcium ion are an important messenger in brain signaling. So, monitoring changing concentration is important for understanding neural communication. For that the dye is used is uh, Oregon green BAPTA 1 and it is highly sensitive to nanomolar calcium 2 plus concentration and which makes it a great tool for mapping resting calcium 2 plus in the cell. And now you can see here it is a spiny dendritic fragment in resting condition and uh, about 5 minute after short bursts of back propagating axon potential a color will change and this color is depending on the, the calcium 2 plus concentration calcium 2 plus concentration. We can also use flame to detect the molecular interactions and the special case for the influence of the local environment on the fluorescence lifetime is known as FRET. We have already discussed it. FRET is a bimolecular fluorescence quenching process where the excited state of a donor fluorophore is non-radiative transferred to a ground state, uh, state uh, acceptor molecule. In this way, fluorescence lifetime serves as a sensor parameter for intra and intermolecular interaction allowing for distant uh, measurement in nanometer range. So, FRET uh, changes the lifetime and so flim can be used to look at the interaction between uh, two different molecules. We can also look at conformational changes. So, applying an intramolecular labeling approach, the distance between a dye and quencher of freight acceptor can also vary along with different conformation of labeled biomolecules. So, in different conformation of biomolecule, the distance between uh, dye acceptor will change and hence uh, just by looking at the distance, we can tell what is the changes um, happening when you go from one conformation to other. So, in this way you can look at intramolecular changes due to folding or action of various motors. Uh, we can also detect aggregation. Aggregation is influenced by local environment. The associated lifetime changes can be used as a probe function. 
flame enables high throughput functional imaging of living organism that can be used to study in vivo mechanism of aggregation. It has the potential to add the search for therapeutic modifiers of protein aggregation uh, and toxicity. Tissue can also be characterized using by using simple autofluorescence, fluorescence from intrinsic fluorophore. The autofluorescence can be characteristic for certain tissues and therefore can be used for tumor detection and uh, there are several important methods which can be utilized for that. The fluorescence decay time of the most endogenous fluorophore depend on binding to protein the metabolic state of tissues, the oxygen concentration and other biologically relevant parameter. The fluorescence decay parameter of NADH fluorescence changes with maturation of cells and during differentiation of stem cells and during apoptosis and necrosis. So, flim data of NADH and FAD has been used to detect precancerous and cancerous alteration. So, there are a lot of applications of uh, there is confocal fluorescence and flim, some of them I have discussed today, uh, the others we will discuss in the next lecture. Thank you, bye.